。OK， 呃，在座的各位呃同仁、各位同学，还有线上的各位呃同仁跟同学，我是呃中山大学中文系的莫家登老师。啊、呃，我今天非常非常荣幸呃，能够欢迎和仲义老师。呃，夫人大学哲学系跟法法文系呃的何何总理老师，呃，南下访问我们中山大学的，啊、呃，那今天呃这场运动是跟我们这个呃思想风云在中山的系列呃演讲有关系的，那我们就非常非常的开心，非常的荣幸，就可以欢迎呃何老师呃到南部来，那今天呃。<笑>今天除了呃何老师的演讲之外，其实我们呃也会明天呃进行呃访谈的活动。那呃我们也很开心，就可以啊、呃、好好的跟呃何老师做一个交流。啊、呃，何老师是真的是我觉得台湾的非常非常优秀的、呃、年轻的跨文化的哲学家啊、呃，他在辅仁大学呃教这个跨文化的呃哲学。那啊。呃其实，呃，贺老师的，你可以说他的研究的兴趣，啊、呃，非常的广泛，呃，他，呃，有发表了呃文章，关于呃，其实呃很多很有意思，非常非常有意思的话题的，啊、呃，你可以说贺老师的呃研究的范围是包含这三个点，有三个很重要的点，第一个点就是这个 the history of philosophy， 就是呃呃哲学的历史，还有我们这么思考就是。在欧洲的哲学家的呃论述当中，他们是怎么表现中国哲哲学的概念？所以就是 representations of Chinese thought in European philosophy， 这是呃第一点。那第二点，这个何老师非常嗯、呃、关心的议题是这个人类记的问题，就是 the Anthropocene， 就是呃生态。呃，文明或者说生态的这个我们现在面对的这个气候变化 （climate change）， 这个气候变化的压力，呃，对我们呃的思想，对我们的生活方式，这对,对我们要进行的改革，都是非常值得去呃探讨的问题了。那呃，特别呃，贺老师是特别关心这个呃，中国大陆有呃一种论述是叫呃生态文明这个论述 （ecological civilization）。那他对这个生态文明的论述也有，呃，发表过呃不少的文章，就呃把这个概念历史化、脉络化，然后呃去思考它的呃它的意义啦、啊，呃，对我觉得他对生态文明的论述的一个解构是非常非常有呃有意思。那第三个，其实这个气候变化还有跨文化哲学意境，呃，很非常的复杂，非常的呃多元，但是。啊、呃，何老师的研究的呃兴趣也包含第三点，一个第三个非常重要的点就是 aesthetics， 就是美学的。他也已经有发表了嗯文文章关于这个电影啊，就是华语系的电影 s i n o p h o n e cinema， 还有华语系电影呃当中的一些跟哲学呃有关的问题，包含感情，包含啊、呃、the image， 就是影像等等。所以，呃，贺老师的呃这个学术是，呃，包含跨文化、跨呃跨文化的哲学，还有呃这个这个呃气候生态的一个思考，还有美学的思考。所以，他是一个很多元的思想家，非常多元的思想家。啊、呃，那今天早上贺老师啊，有、呃、对我们非常好，就有送给中山大学文学院。他最近发表的两本书，两本书，呃，都呃都是用呃法语发表的，呃，第一本书是这个呃 Orientalism, Occidentalism et Universalism, Histoire et méthode de représentation croisée entre monde européen et chinois， 啊、呃，所以就是这个呃，在我们这么去思考一些关键的概念，还有历史，在一个这个跨文化的角度，就是从。呃，这个欧洲跟中国的历史，在这个复杂交错的一个关系当中，我们这么去思考呃历史跟呃这个哲学本身，所以这个是一个非常呃有意思，我很期待阅读它。那第二本书是呃，他跟呃一些呃同仁，就是同时一起发表的，呃，是关于 l e r e p r e s e n t a t i o n q u a s i e u r o p e du v i n t i e s i e a n a l y s e 就是二十世纪的。这个欧洲跟中国的一个呃互相交流或者一些
这个 representation 化解就是交错的表现，就是应该是欧洲这么思考中国，中国这么思考欧洲，这样一个跨文化的一个交错的过程，一个 interaction 的过程，呃呃，也是就是这本书所讨论的，所以啊、呃，我也很期待啊、呃、阅读它啊、呃。那今天呃的呃演讲。The theme is transcultural studies, transcendental philosophy, and the metaphysics of love, creating connections between things standing apart. I think this is a very interesting theme, especially this creating connections between things standing apart. So we are in a self and other between, or separate things. 呃，两个东西之间，我们到底要怎么连接？这是非常有趣的呃一个呃呃呃题目啊、呃。那呃，我们把时间交给贺老师之前，我呃还是要欢迎我们赖西山院长呃，也是这个思选风韵的系列呃演讲的活动呃的另外一个非常重要的协助的伙伴呃，那我就把时间交给赖西山老师呃，进一步的介绍贺忠义老师，谢谢大家。呃，啊，大家午安啊！我想那个江南已经对何老师的这个他的这个 academic 的部分啊，做了很具体的呃呃触角很广的周延的介绍了哈、啊。那我这边只要强调就是说，呃，今天何老师的今天的演讲，这个应该是他的 the third time 第三次来到中山了。从上一次他来谈这个。t r a n s c u l t u r e 的问题，呃，已经种下了跟中山的一个、呃、深刻的缘分。就我们当时候就邀好，就是说希望他能够持续呃跟中山的老师们、呃师生们进行多层次的学术的互动。那么去年我们也促成了，呃呃，他跟呃何华比呃对海这个对于东方的理解，从台湾的角度。呃，去思考这个问题。那当当时我们就可以看得出来，就是，呃，何仲宇对于海德格尔的这个带有东方主义的某一种挖掘呢，啊，是跟台湾跟大陆学者对海德格尔的接受有蛮不一样的观点。然后从台湾的角度去思考，台湾这这种跨化处境里面，啊，怎么怎么反思啊，怎么反思自我的处境。那么我想，他今天的演讲，从他的题目里面就会看得出来，是非常具有这种 French style， 所以，呃，这种非常法式的角度，呃，我觉得在呃台湾特别的呃灵活哈、哦，啊，那我这边只要强调的就是说，我们这一个计划，呃，是来自于教育部的标杆计划，那么我们的一系列访谈，那个呃，刚好有人长来赖了。中学院长到，呃，这个系列的访问就是说，明天有一个专专门的访问，还是有 Mark 对何老师的呃专门的访谈的拍摄。那拍摄的拍摄的影片将来会成为国家图书馆典藏，然后到呃世界传播。啊、呃，就是我们对于呃国际汉学家、汉学哲学家，呃，尤其。本身从事国际汉学的跨文化的沟通跟交流，那又落地生根在台湾，我想何老师就具备这几种身份，既是一个国际学者，然后同时不断在进行跨文化的交流，然后又具有台湾深厚的呃文化生活的经验，这样的学者是我们这一系列的访谈里面呃认为最典范型的学者，所以我想明天的访问呢。呃，会非常的精彩，也能够为何老师在台湾的这个框画研究留下很重要的影片的记录。那么今天，我想我就不占时间，我们就来啊、呃、一起来参与他的这个非常呃有意思的这个演讲的题目。好、哦，好，我们欢迎何老师。非常感谢，欢迎何老师。那呃，各位朋友，就稍微提醒大家，就呃，今天的演讲的题目主要是会用英文进行，但是我们 Q&A 的时候，当然可以呃，用法语、中文、呃，西班牙语，呃，都可以啊、呃，所以我们就呃，很很欢迎何老师。这个非常荣幸哈，谢谢，非常感谢你们。然后我会用这个计划，事实上想再样一下，我在呃，从我的。
PhD 呃开始讨论这些知识的问题到现在，呃，所以我想有有一种啊、呃、testament 这一种啊的、呃、一种感觉，因为就是说，嗯，所以我就觉得啊、呃，我们也不知道我们是什么时候会走，是不是明天，或者是今天，或者是到后天。所以就是要抓我一个这么大的机会来，可以呃，但是自己的我们想什么，我们要说什么，然后是不是可以给我们这样一种贡献？我们我们想要的贡献是什么贡献？嗯，对，所以我我就是觉得呃，因为你刚刚说很年轻，可是我一定觉得嗯，实际上已经也不是。所以就是这么做，就是我们在这边的呃事件不是为了浪费自然资源而已啊，可是也是也有它的贡献，这个是很难得。然后我们就想找一个理由，我们可以合理化我们在这边的的的出现哈。好，所以啊、uh, ，so I will 呃、uh, ，restart my phone。呃 ，so as I said， 嗯、um, ，yes。So uh, I will start my talk now, uh, now in English. So again, thanks uh, a lot for the uh, University of Sun Yat-sen for inviting me here. Thanks a lot for the uh, Department of Chinese uh, for this invitation and for this own uh, project. So my uh, topic, I will try to address different issues at the same time and try to uh, retrospectively uh, define a kind of current consistency between different things that I try to say. Okay. So, the first thing is, um, I will try to present, I will say, a metaphysic of transcultural philosophy. What I mean is that I will try to uh, present what are the philosophical principles that are behind the practice of doing comparative philosophy of addressing the question of the transcultural. So when we are doing that, uh, my, my, my aim is not to perform a case study. Uh, I will try to go to that at the end, but just to try to root this uh, approach of transcriptural philosophy in some, in its original philosophical grant. So, and here we start with the uh, first part with the uh, epistemology, meta-epistemology of life, and then trying to go through life philosophy to transcriptural philosophy, and then transcriptural philosophy to metaphysic of love, uh, to transcendental philosophy, transcendental philosophy to metaphysic of love, and metaphysic of love to then uh, um, case study. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, uh, my point is why I, I think that these three things can be put together is that in the most abstract way of looking at these things, uh, the idea is that there is a structural similarity between different, uh, in the different modalities of connecting things together, be it culture, transcultural ideas, transcendental, or people. Law. And uh, reading all these things, there is something we call uh, life. And so I will just start by this. So in my uh, yes, so in my PhD thesis, uh, I, I try to uh, to assess a, a, a definition of the concept of life, which try to avoid two common pitfalls and two common narratives. The first is usually life is understood uh, either in biological or in phenomenological terms. That means that usually we equate life to living forms or subjective contents. And these two conceptions are radically opposed. So, for example, that means that for in terms of a more positivist approach of life, life is defined only by biology and by organic forms, like, for example, Auguste concept. But on the other side, uh, from a philosophical, uh, from a phenomenological perspective, uh, on the contrary, it will say that uh, biology, modern biology, cannot really approach the reality of living. And so even some philosophical, some phenomenological uh, philosopher will say that contemporary biology 
is not the science of the living, which is, of course, a very provocative statement. So here, we have two radically opposed conceptions of life as uh, income, as represented by organic form of life, or, on the contrary, not represented by these uh, organic forms, but by subjective, con uh, subjective contents. And so I will say that both of them are lacunary uh, in the sense that if you define life in organic terms, uh, that means here you will have a problem of defining the, the origin of life, since life has uh, emerged from inorganic environment. So it was the first a problem to defining life simply in biological organic terms, since uh, there is no actually sharp boundary between living and non-living. Okay? And if you define life in subjective terms, in terms of pure conscious, consciousness or intentionality, and then you uh, always go, go back to the problem of embodiment. So, I, uh, at this moment, yes, so at this moment, I try to find a different uh, way to, uh, to overcome this, this problem. So I go to uh, ancient Greek etymology. In ancient Greek etymology, you have two definitions uh, you have two concepts, zoe, for biological life, and bios, for experienced life. So, zoe as the organic form of life, and bios as the existential form of life. And then, when you look in Greek, you see that there, that there is another term to define life, which is ion. And uh, so you have uh, zoe and bios, and you have the position between defining life in terms of zoe, or defining, defining life in terms of bios. And to overcome this opposition, I, I go back to this uh, concept of uh, notion in Greek of iron, and what is interesting is that the notion of iron uh, it has an interesting evolution um, in the beginning. Uh, so uh, iron means vital force, and at, at the beginning it, it was referring to vital force, and the end it starts to, to define eternity. So here is the notion of life in terms of iron, in the beginning, it is what makes the, the living, uh, uh, bodies living, and at, and at the end, it becomes eternity, something which is a, a, a notion of duration. But even if originally, even so, today, when you speak, think about iron, you think about eternity, about time, but at, this, at the beginning, it was just a manifestation of the power of life, of life as, um, yes, as the potential of life. Okay? And, and, and so, uh, in this regard, we say that life is neither an organic body nor a conscious mind. It is a power, a power of what? Of connecting things that have never been associated before. And this notion of connecting things that have never been associated before is closely linked to the notion of... Sorry. It's closely linked to the notion of emergence. And so you have actually, when you speak about life, uh, sometimes you can define two different moments of the emergence. Okay, so for the, so nucleotides from, from molecules in organic life or consciousness from neurons for subjective life. But actually you can say that life is emergence itself in its every, every moment. And here I'm referring to what Michel Zell said. So it means that the operation of life is not, is not, cannot be localized in one space of time. It is a, a continuous process. And here, kind of referring to Bergson's notion of, of life and duration. So emergence refers to the fact that the association of existing things into a new composition overcome the limits of its very condition of apparition. And this, why, why I'm mentioning that, so I start with the notion of life. Life is not organic body, it's not conscious mind, it is iron as a vital force and duration. And uh, it is a process of what? A process of connecting, connecting molecules, uh, connecting um, people. And um, here, this notion of connection is linked to the notion of emergence. And this notion of emergence, in some sense, it relates to, uh, the, to the one of the approach, one of the way to define the transcendental, but in a more physical way. So what emergence means, it refers to the fact that the association between things that exist already creates a composition of a thing that does not exist before. Okay. 
So from here, I'm going to the uh, part of the transcendental. So here, I will go back to, to the articulation between emergence and transcendental, saying that the emergence is a physical form of the transcendental. Okay, so uh, in, uh, here I will start to develop the association between relation between transcendental philosophy and transcultural philosophy. First, I will refer to, the, uh, to a paper um, that, has, that has been uh, writ uh, written recently by a PhD student called Timo Enen, and uh, it is entitled uh, Two Forms of con Conditionality of Intercultural Understanding and Free Contemporary Re Responses. So, in this uh, paper, uh, this uh, PhD student in um, Hong Kong uh, Science Technology University, he analyzed the concept of transcultural philosophy in the works of three, uh, uh, three uh, two important persons, uh, Eric Nelson and uh, Ko Inglo, and one less important, myself. And uh, he, uh, I think it's interesting because he points out the articulation of transcultural philosophy with Kant's conception of, of the transcendental, something that I am trying to develop recently. So here, uh, I will try to, uh, to, to um, start by uh, demonstrating to you why the notion of transcendental philosophy, which seems to be very, uh, we say, very philosophical and perhaps difficult, is actually uh, closely connected to the issue of the methodology of transcultural philosophy. So, what is a transcendental? So, we got, have to go back to Kant. So, Kant's original concept is that first, uh, re regarding Kant's original concept, first we need to remind that transcendental is different from transcendent. Transcendent means knowledge that is beyond experience. Transcendental means the possibility condition of knowledge about experience. And this uh, distinction is very important uh, in Kant philosophy and I would say in modern philosophy of the Kant. And transcendental means the condition of possibility of the constitution of something like an experience in terms of the unity of the subject in relation to the priority of the world. That means that what is transcendental is the capacity of the subject to unify different, uh, the, the multitude of uh, things that are coming to the world in something that is a unique experience. And this is a condition of possibility of experience itself. Without this capacity to, uni to unify the different parts of the experience, there won't be any kind of experience. Okay, so this is transcendental, condition of possibility of something. And uh, so here, uh, uh, for Kant, it says that um, in order to define the transcendental, I will quote Kant. Uh, it is also called in uh, in paper, papers. Um, so it says that the a priori condition of a possible experience in general are at the same time conditions of the possibility of the object of experience. Now, I assert that the categories are nothing other than the conditions of thinking in a possible experience. And without that sort of unity, foregoing and universal is necessary, unity of consciousness will not encounter in the manifold perceptions. But these would then belong to no experience and would consequently be without an object and will be nothing but a blind play of representation, less even than doing. Okay. So again, the notion of transcendental is linked to the notion of unity of, con of consciousness. So uh, we can say that the transcendental is a playing middle field between universal categories and modern sensations, the place where the relation of the subject to himself becomes consciousness. And then, and through, through that pro process, he can unify the experience. He can have an experience. So the uh, transcendental so the, the transcendental re relate to something that can't exist without experience while not originating from it. So now, uh, what I try to, 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 uh, to present is, uh, I try to present the notion of transcendental uh, in, Kant, in Kant, not to explain the, this notion, but then, in, in two minutes, I will try to use all the definition of Kant to define the transcendental, to use the same to define the transcultural just by changing some terms. Okay. So, Kant said, for all or, uh, our empirical knowledge begins with experience, it, is by no means, it by no means follows that all arise out of experience. It begins with, but is not coming out of it. The transcendental relates to a specific mode of thinking, which is about possibility condition and not universal in general. Not every condition of a priori is transcendental, but only those through which we coincide that how 
that and how certain representation are applied or are possible only a priori. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and so this is the definition of count. Now, what's, what's interesting even more is the fact that the count notion of the transcendental has been developed by post kantian field philosopher. And uh, in Schelling, there is uh, something that seems to me uh, important to, to the things that I said uh, uh, previously about philosophy of life and, transcendent and emergence and transcendental, is that uh, in, uh, in the philosophy of Schelling, transcendental means also that the condition of or something is a part of these things be without being reducible to this thing. What I mean is, of course, paradoxical because uh, Schilling itself, he opposed uh, his natural philosophy to uh, Kant's uh, uh, philosophy of the transcendental. But uh, I will say that there is a kind of reading in the sense that, um, again, uh, natural philosophy demonst demonstrates the articulation between emergence and transcendental as a kind of naturalistic, uh, naturalistic embodiment of the transcendental. Cannot. Okay? And then if you. Oh. Sometimes it's one, sometimes. Okay. And then I cannot really uh, so much develop, but again, we can also uh, look at Bergson philosophy from this uh, transcendental perspective, which is again very uh, paradoxical because, Kant, because Bergson opposed to Kant philosophy in every possible way. But we can say that duration in Kant philosophy is the condition of possibility of experience. That means that it's not the, uh, the subjective perception of the, of the subject of himself, but time itself, which in this case is the field of um, the condition of possibility of experience. Okay. Then, then finally, for the transcendental, and then I will go to, to the transcriptural, we can add a, a delusion layer to this history of the transcendental, which is a kind of final moment of this history in the recent uh, history of uh, modern philosophy in the West. So uh, for uh, Deleuze, uh, the transcendental mean, uh, what does that mean? It means that the fa faculty is indistinguishable from its disjointed, superior, or transcendent exercise. And here uh, I will remind you. I will uh, perhaps it's important. I will, I will um, refer to that when I'm speaking later on on metaphysics of love. So each faculty must be born to the extreme point of its dissolution, at which it falls prey to triple violence. So what I mean here is that while for Kant the transcendental is a condition of the perception of the subject, for the love the transcendental is a process of desubjectivation. And, and this desubjectivation is defining the transcendental not actually as the possibility of experience, but as the, necessarily, the necessary impossibility of it. That means that the problem is not what is the condition of thinking. The problem is what forces us to think. So why we have no choice but to think. So this is in this way that uh, the Lutz redefines the notion of the transcendental. So he says, it is the violence of that which forces it to be exercised, of that which is forced to grasp and which is alone is able to grasp, yet also that of the ungraspable. What forces sensibility to sense? What is it that can, no, can only be sensed, yet is imperceptible at the same time? And for the Lutz, we see at this moment that uh, transcendental has a meaning, the transcendent exercise, exercise of a faculty emerge, appears, is manifested. So here we can already understand the limits of the phenomenological approach of life and also of intellectual philosophy, in my own perspective, because transcendental is something that is lived but not experienced, or experienced but not perceived. So in this sense, no, it is neither a matter of being conscious or having a dialogue. I will go back to this uh, uh, cultural dialogue. So now uh, I try to bridge the notion of transcendental with the notion of transcultural. Okay. 
So besides that, transcendent means a knowledge that is beyond experience, and transcendental means the possibility condition of knowledge about experience. In the same way, I will propose, uh, and then we can discuss, to say that transcultural does not mean what is beyond culture, but the, possi con but the possibility condition of knowledge about culture. And Kant says, to all uh, empirical knowledge begins with experience, it by no means follows that all arises out of experience. Similarly, transculturality means that for all our philosophical knowledge begins with culture, it by no means follows that all arises out of culture. So here, I am uh, changing the notion of transcendent tone by the notion of transcultural and trying to define it in as transcultural philosophy as the new transcendental philosophy. This is my, my point, uh, actually. So transcultural knowledge is neither empirically reducible to culture, nor transcendentally independent from it. It is immanent to all cultural enunciations, the transcultural. It is immanent to all cultural enunciations as the condition of possibility. Each cultural contribution to world philosophy is linked to its potential of transculturality. And then we have to remember that for Deleuze, uh, transcendence means uh, the impossibility condition of something, means the superior ex exercise of something. And so here, transculturality means also the limits of uh, um, culture in itself. Okay. Then the link between transcendental and transcultural is not only analogical. Actually, as I said, transcultural philosophy is a necessary development of transcendental philosophy itself. So when we are doing transcultural philosophy, we are not doing something that is simply related to Chinese studies or Western studies. We are actually doing philosophy in itself. And, uh, but first, we need perhaps to, to define more the notion of transcultural, because I, 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 what I mean by transcultural now. I try to make this analogy now, going back to the uh, transcultural. So the, the notion of transcultural itself, if I reflect historically of this, it comes from a specific point of intellectual life. It comes uh, at the moment of the exhaustion of the, all the post-theological narratives, post-modern, post-constructivist, post-historic, post post-colonial, post 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 etc. So this is what I would call discursive post-theology. And so this discursive postology, it was actually, uh, at this moment of the time, uh, linked to the idea of the end of history. The end of history uh, is uh, the, the end of all narrative, meta-narrative for, for Lyotard in the postmodern. And here the notion was, after the, Berlin, uh, the fall of the Berlin War, that was the end of it, history. So we, are in, we were in post-history as well, we were in postmodern. However, the 4th June uh, Tiananmen tanks, uh, it was uh, two, 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 two days ago, uh, the, the commemoration of this event that can, or today only takes place in Taiwan, as you know. Uh, here, we are actually no more in a post-history, because actually it is a new kind of history that is starting, and not the, the, the end of history. And this new kind of history is a kind of trans-historical one. So here, I will reinterpret this uh, 1989 uh, event uh, in terms of no more end of history, but end, the end of the end of history. Actually, what we thought was the end of history was the manifestation of the end of the end of history. And the end of the end of history, this is what I call, you see, trans-historical. Uh, okay. So the common misunderstanding about the transcultural is to confuse it with the cross-cultural. To believe that transcultural means a meeting, a blending of different cultures due to contemporary globalization process. Here, we have an empirical definition of the transcultural. It's not a transcendental definition. If we define transcultural simply as a fact of meeting, as a fact of mixing, we have an empirical definition of it and not a transcendental definition of it. Thus, not a truly philosophical understanding of it. So, transculturality, trans transculturality does not mean the end of all cultures, like post-cultural, neither the empiric local mixing up, cross-cultural. So, transcultural is not post-cultural, it's not cross-cultural. 
even if in Chinese, for one, one, it seems that we have stuck because there is one, one word for cross-cultural and trans-cultural, or we say chai uh, kuang I don't know, yeah. So trans-cultural in our understanding means, first, the uh, this deconstruction of the category of culture, defined uh, by uh, late uh, 18th century, and post, uh, German post christian thinkers and 19th century uh, anthropology. But this, I have already uh, spoke about that and published about that, so perhaps I won't uh, um, spend so, too much time on it. I will just uh, remind that this uh, definition of culture appears in the end of the uh, 18th century, beginning of, of, of the 19th century, with the emergence of the notion of Forstgeist. And uh, the emergence of the notion of Forstgeist was actually a concept that was addressed, uh, that was pointed out to the limitation of the uh, concept of the rational notion of the universalism. And uh, there is actually, in the notion of Forstgeist itself, uh, something that is uh, strongly related to the notion of cultural essentialism, which is because fourth guys means to go back to what defines the essential uh, culture of one people. And actually you have a whole historical, uh, uh, I would say, evolution from uh, the notion of fourth guys and culture to uh, orientalism, occidentalism, etc. Via uh, the, uh, uh, via, uh, I would say, uh, post Keynesian uh, uh, German uh, uh, thinkers. Okay. So, um, uh, as I said, and again, uh, here uh, you, you can think of the, def of the delusion definition of the transcendental. Uh, transcultural means a deconstruction of the culturist definition of culture. So, transcultural is not simply a meeting of culture, of different cultures that are coming to together. It actually entails a, a radical deconstruction of the culturalist definition of culture. I didn't say a negation of culture. I said a, a deconstruction of the culturalist definition of culture. It's not the same. So transcultural means, of course, uh, a fact that um, means also that um, culture defines themselves in the contact with others. I will go back to, 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 to that. The cross-cultural concept implies that, but the problem with the cross-cultural concept is that it implies that Cultures are already constituted when they meet. I mean, cross-cultural, in my understanding, is that you have culture A, you have culture B, and then they meet. My, my understanding of the transcultural is that culture A and culture B, culture A and culture B does not exist before they meet. Okay. So it's in the process of meetings that they define themselves. Okay? This is uh, the, the notion. Okay? Yeah. Uh, we can discuss. Uh, and, and then this notion of cross-cultural for me is uh, idealistic and essentialist. Uh, because I will say that before uh, interaction between China and the West, for example, or China and what was the West for China, because the West for China was not always the West. The West for China was India, it was uh, different things. It evolved also around the time. And so that it is only by uh, defining itself in opposition of the West that China defined what is China. So in this sense, uh, Ula, but, uh, yeah, So in this sense, uh, transcultural goes almost in opposition to uh, to what Heidegger uh, said when he defines a stranger, because for for uh, um, Heidegger, it would seem that um, to understand what the stranger is is a way to understand what we are. And he says that this encounter, what is produced by this encounter, is not a mixing up. It is, on the contrary, a, a even clearer distinction of you and me. Okay. So here, I will say, I will say almost, I, I will more uh, uh, go with Derrida definition of difference, when he says that the proper of one culture is to not be identical to identical to itself. So it is. To, uh, to be in the process of always differing from itself, from oneself, as a culture in its and culture with others. Okay. So, as a, for a conclusion for this transcultural part, I will. Uh, okay. 
And we say that perhaps we can define four definitions for understanding of the transcultural. First, we can define a transcultural as something very body, uh, I mean, something very uh, biophysical. Transcultural is means that all human beings they have the same uh, cognitive processes, basic cognitive processes, and um, and then because you have this evolutionary information of human being. So what is transcultural is is what is behind, uh, I mean, below culture. So we can have a definition of transcultural, uh, transcultural as what is below culture, culture. But this is, this would be, I would say, a biophysical uh, uh, transcultural. Then you can have also kind of immanent social transcultural. That means that, as I said, some things that come from the hybridization of different cultures in the same location in a given period of time. And for example, globalization, etc. But here, we see something empirical. This is also transcultural, but it is empirical. And then we have a transcendent transcultural, which is something which uh, is um, a transcendent transcultural, which is something which will be beyond cultures. Okay? That means uh, um, kind of uh, spiritual unity, uh, I mean, shared concept, and uh, categ uh, bigger categories, etc. And then, uh, what I will uh, try to uh, promote and to, uh, is to uh, transcendental definition of transcultural as the condition of possibility of the making of culture as something that calls for a subject that does not exist yet. This I will uh, explain later. Okay. So, um, okay. Here, what I will try to do now is to try to a little demonstrate why I say that transcultural philosophy comes from philosophy itself. What I will try to uh, do is to, uh, I don't know, I mean, try to, I'm, I'm not sure it will be convincing enough, but to try to demonstrate that modern philosophy um, in its development um, goes to today this question of the transcultural, starting from Kant and the, the notion of the transcendental. But I cannot devote so much time to that uh, because already uh, yeah, time is going uh, kind of uh, quickly. So here, um, I will say that uh, just to, to, to have this kind of summary of uh, history of modern philosophy after Kant. Uh, Kant. So uh, after Kant, we can say that the notion of transcendental goes into direction, objectivist and subjectivist, so to speak. So for Hegel, uh, the transcendental cannot be defined in terms of the subjective and universal condition of possibility to relate to object of genome, uh, in, uh, of right in genome because uh, the human subject is itself nothing but part of the evolution of spirit. Spirit is a real substance. So the evolution of spirits is dialectical and historical. And its incarnation goes through matter, life, and culture, and then through different people. And at the end, spirit becomes fully aware of itself in a German civil society, to, re to summarize quickly. And then you have the Marxist critique of this uh, idealist definition of history. So Marx he accentuates the fact that uh, the objectivation of the transcendental uh, in the relation of the uh, in the issue of the relation between of the relation between man and work. So the free determination of spirit is man man as de-alienated from work by the reorganization of the economic condition of production. That means that for Marx. Uh, speaking about economy, political economy, and work is a way to define, redefine the philosophy of the transcendental. And I will go on, and of course it's a very broad uh, redefinition of history of modern philosophy, I, I know that. And uh, Foucault, he, he achieved this objectivation of the transcendental by giving to it a political turn. So it's not only the problem of the economic condition of production, it is a problem of the subject is a product of uh, political forces. So it is a kind of uh, different uh, way to objectify the, uh, um, the transcendental subject. But uh, in Foucault, this, uh, this redefinition of the subject through political forces is at the end uh, going back to the notion of the more subjective definition of, um, of subjectivity, um, of the unity of experience. Uh, by the notion of self-affection. That means that for uh, uh, Foucault in his last text about sexuality, and so this is why we speak about that after. after. 
in the aspect of, self, uh, of sexuality, uh, you have self-affection, a process of affecting its oneself that can, that come, uh, that can in some sense, um, avoid the pitfalls of uh, being the uh, being the being the result of power forces. Okay, now we have the other part of the story of the transcendental with the subjective part and starting with uh, Fichte and the notion of and the dialectic between self and non-self. Okay, and go going quickly and then uh, we, we can say that this pa path we, uh, is achieved by the, the sense when you define uh, the um, when you have the world in terms of what the subject can project into it. However, this uh, radical subjectivation of the transcendental leaves open the question of the incarnation, and then the relation between the I as a pure subject for himself and as a simple object for the other uh, is uh, uh, manifested by uh, Sartre's concept of reification and gaze, and then male gaze, etc., colonial gaze, etc. Okay. And uh, then I'm finished with that, uh, almost, part. And so here we can also say that uh, Heidegger he tried to bridge Husserl and Hegel uh, when he uh, made this uh, with the dubious result of assimilating the self-determination of the design to the fate of uh, Germany itself, and uh, Nazi Germany at this moment of the time. And then in the light of Heidegger, he tried to shift from German people to German language, but I'm not sure that this is uh, enough to achieve transcultural uh, because uh, it is still rooted in one specific language, the language of being. Okay. So uh, the notion of the transcendental, as I said, is then reactivated by Deleuze, and transcendental relates no more to condition of possibility. Um, uh, yes, of, of possibility. Sorry, uh, the transcendental becomes becomes what makes it impossible not to not to think, not to feel, etc and means the encounter with the outside. Okay. And then we go back to uh, starting to uh, develop the second, uh, third aspect of metaphysical of love. So here, to summarize, transcultural is not referring to any empirical culture and is not beyond culture altogether. It is not even a simple mix or hybridization of different cultures since a composite of empirical ent entities is still empirical. If it is related to the, to the notion of, um, of hybridization, it is precisely in terms of its possibility condition. That means the problem of the, of the transcultural is to know what makes cultures, what makes it possible the encounter of culture. And that means, in a delusion sense, the transcendental transcultural is um, ask us the question: what makes cultures impossible not to mix, impossible not to, impossible not to meet? So the transcultural as a condition of possibility of cultural hybridization is not simply the fact of this hybridization. It is, um, it is something that is sometimes... Um, so the transcultural as a condition possibility of cultural hybridization as the mutual and reciprocal transformation of different cultures is something that is at the same time beyond comparability and forces culture to meet. So what forces culture to meet? This is a way. This is uh, in this in this in answering this question, we can uh, go back uh, to uh, the association between transcendental and transcultural. So here, the problem of the, the transcultural as transcendental is to define what is the condition possibility of the meeting of culture, and this condition of possibility stands is in the in the event that makes them impossible not to meet. And this, uh, and actually, there is two kind of event that makes that makes impossible that makes cultures impossible not to meet. The first is war, and the second is love. And, uh, and because of war, you you, you meet uh, you, you you do meet. And um, I will speak about the second one here. So this is why, for me, the uh, Abel, Abel Martian model of communi of communication, which frame intercultural studies, cannot work. Cultural encounter is not rational dialogue. It is fated law. I will try to explain why now. So here I will start to develop the notion of metaphysics of love, and I will start with love, and I will uh, finish by sexuality uh, on this, uh, uh, of this uh, section. So the metaphysics of love is as old as philosophy itself. 
It is often said that philosophy is a love of knowledge, Lydia and Sophia. But actually, I will reverse the proposal. Philosophy is not simply the love of knowledge, but the knowledge of love. Because to know is to know of to love, and to love is to love to know. So this is the real uh, definition of philosophy, it's not the, the love of knowledge. It is the fact that to, to know someone is to love someone, and to, and to love someone is to, to, the desire to know him at the same time. If you love someone, that means that you want to know more about him. And the fact that you, you, do, know more, you do know more about him is in this process of falling into the trap that is named love. So, according to, uh, according to pre-Socratic philosopher, uh, Empedocles, as I say, there is two uh, principles, love and hate. And love means converging, and hate means diverging. So here, what is interesting for me is that in the, uh, in the beginning, I, I, I try to define life, not in terms of Zoe, or, I, or no, Bios, but in terms of Ion, and with this idea of connection. And here, uh, this idea of what, what connects things together is love. And hate is what uh, disconnects them. Okay, so as we know, uh, love is an essential part of Plato philosophy. So desire, a desire is what leads the soul to reach out to what is beyond appearances, to go through all the scales of reality, from the love of the body to the love of the soul to the love of the ideas in themselves. Um, but actually, it's the, the Plato metaphysics, the Plato epistemology in itself, is uh, can help us to understand the nature of love. Very simply. Um, to love someone is to desire to know, but to know, we need to compare. So, Plato is start from that, that. Knowledge always includes a comparison. But when we compare two things, when we compare A to B, A to B, the reference of our comparison is neither A and B, it is something else. So, to know what is beautiful, we have to compare things of different beauty. Be, uh, uh, beauty. Beauty, sorry. But this comparison won't be possible without us relating to beauty itself. So, uh, uh, so in order to, to know what is one thing, I need to compare to another thing. Because uh, knowledge is by comparison. But the comparison of one thing to another thing won't be possible if we won't compare both of them to something that are not. And from which point we can, we can compare them back. So, actually it's the same thing with love. So, love is not simply one person loving another one. And the question whether the part we love is body, soul, or spirit, it doesn't matter. Love is not simply reciprocal or mutual love. Each one uh, loving the other as much as is loved by the other, etc. Love is more than two persons relating to each other. This is why when we love, we don't simply love the other for what he is or she is. We love her and him for what we see in him, her. This is why. The others, they never can understand why we love someone. They say, why we love her? Okay, she has nothing. Okay, because we said that. Okay? And this is, all Proust is about that. Okay? They fall in love with people, and the others, they don't understand why he's, he's loving this, this girl, etc. Okay? And that, but that doesn't mean that love is delusional. Uh, I don't think so. uh, that would be a very easy answer. I think on the contrary, that means that when we love, we are relating the other to something else. Hola. You should have told me. <laughs> when we love, we don't simply love another person. When we love, we love love, as Augustine said. Okay, I'm a okay. I was loving love. I was in love with love. A beautiful sentence. <laughs> that does not mean that, uh, what does, that doesn't mean that the other, it just means to love love. That means that when we love, we don't simply love another person. We love love through this other person. So it doesn't mean that the other is just a mean to love love. Really love someone when and because this other is the only one that gives to us this any access to love. And loving the other for love, we see love in the other. And when the other loves us similarly, us through love and love for us, then love is real. Okay, so here love is the third term in the Platonician way between the two lovers. And to relate to one another, to love each other, we have to love love. And by loving love, but, but in order to love love, we have, if there is only one person in the world which can help us to, to can give us access to love in itself. So, uh, um, yes. 
So, and not only love is real, but it's only through that love of love that when we love the other similarly, we can truly understand ourselves. And this is the definition of philosophy. Okay, this is why philosophy is called like that. Because when we love the other, we can understand ourselves. And perhaps here you can understand the relation with the transcultural. Yes? Uh, but this understanding of oneself through loving and being loved is not simply psychological but metaphysical. Love is what gives us uh, access to our pure singularity. In love, we reach out through the love of the other to our body as an idea in God, or our spirit, an idea in God. In God, okay, you, you can put anything else okay, if you don't like this word. Okay. This is why sexuality is an integral part of love. And here, quoting uh, 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 Spinoza. Because love is something made, and in this making, body and spirit, and spirit are united in a common searching song. So for me, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, Sex, Sex Exists, and this book uh, is for me the book that achieved uh, 400 years of modern philosophy and closed the gap opened by Descartes' meditation between uh, soul and body, between uh, uh, body and spirit. Okay, so here I will. Uh, I will uh, speak a little about Jean-Luc Nancy's notion of sexuality. And my point is that the way uh, Jean-Luc Nancy defines sexuality, it is the best model possible to understand what transcultural is. Because it is really meeting. So in Corpus 2, writing on sexuality, Jean-Luc Nancy defines the sexual relation as the embodiment of relation itself. Relation not as relation to someone, in this sense, there is no sexual relation, as Lacan famously said. But relation to the relation itself. In the sense, every relation is sexual. In the same sense that any act of religion is an expression of life. So, uh, quoting Jean-Luc Nancy, when we make love, we pause or expose relation as such. We pause its unrelatable character explicitly. The paradox here is that by making love, we expose infinition as such. So he said, sexual relation represents the inconsumability of relations on its own term. All relations can be perfected, accomplished, saturated, and or exhausted. But the sexual relation represents an accomplishment of relations. In the sense that there is no end of uh, the process of making love, except another time. So the sexual, uh, in all relations, linguistic, social, affective, aesthetics, resides in the, in the dimension of an accomplishment. It's a beautiful an idea. So, what is sexual in all relations is the fact that in, each, in every kind of, uh, of relation, or liaison, as I said in the beginning, there is something that is unaccomplished. So, the nature of the sexual relation, and why it is the best model to understand the cultural encounter and transcendental transcultural liberality, is, what, is, that when, is that we can reach ourselves only through the other and that we can reach the other only in ourselves. Thus, the subtitle. Okay. In a process that is reaching out to the inside of the outside, mutually and reciprocally perform. So here, I won't quote um, uh, uh, but here's the notion, is, one point is interesting for us. He said, there is no longer an other in the ordinary sense of the world, just as there is no one uh, just as there is no self-sameness of fusion. And this is precisely this notion that there is no longer an, uh, an other and no fusion, no self-sameness, uh, which is for me the best way to define what transculturality is about. The two uh, are caught up in a mingling that is not just a mingling of these different bodies, but at the same time the bearing of four distinctions connected to the representation of daily life. And here, going back to the transcendental as something that is exceeding our power, our, our capacity, our ordinary capacity to feel, ordinary capacity to think. And because there is something that exceeds our ordinary capacity to think, this makes us thinking. Because there is something that uh, exceeds our ordinary culture, in this process of being confronted to something that is exce uh, exceeding our own culture, we are uh, Confronted to a process which is transcultural. 
And so this notion of reaching out to the inside of the inside, uh, inside of the outside, the notion that we reach the other only through us and the other reach himself only through, through us, which is what the sexual relation is about, is, uh, for me, uh, the best model for transcripturality. And of course, it's kind of different than uh, speaking about the cultural dialogue and all this rational thing, okay? I totally go to the irrational uh, 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 side of the of that here. Yeah. So in this process, what is rich is our own otherness. What is achieved is difference, not as difference with someone else, like in, uh, okay, like uh, your culture, my culture, your culture, my culture, but difference with oneself. That means that in the process of relation with the other, we are different from, our, from, from ourselves. And in this free fall into love, there is nothing which you can, can hold back to, except becoming as becoming other. Becoming other with the other, thanks to him or her. And uh, for me, this process of constant differentiation of life through love, uh, it uh, reminds me um, uh, an idea that we can find in Tantric Buddhism. And uh, when uh, this, uh, so there is this uh, notion that in the beginning there is Atman, and there is just only one, uh, one person. And he says that, but he doesn't, he has no pleasure to be alone. So, so he wants to be two. And then, he, yeah, there is male and female. But when the male wants to, to be attached to the female, the female becomes something else. And in order to, to reach, to reach uh, her, he becomes also something else. And then, you have the creation of all things in reality. Okay? So this is uh, the metaphysics of uh, Tantric Buddhism. Okay? A process of constant differentiation by, uh, by ways of trying to reach out for the other. When we reach out uh, to when we reach out to the other, the other is becoming other, and then we need to also become other to reach out to him again and again and again, okay. and always uh, and always falling. And this is why we and this is why we, we say fall in love because love is a fall. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, I will go uh, to more I would say perhaps traditional thing and uh, transcultural philosophy, comparative philosophy, and uh, yeah. So here I will try to present a kind of uh, history of the history of comparative philosophy. And uh, I will try to use a concept that I developed to try to define a new framework for comparative uh, uh, studies. Okay. So um, if you look at the long durée, at the long time of um, encounter between China and the West, generally it is divided into periods. Sinophilia, Sinophilia, uh, uh, 17th, 18th century, and then Sinophobia, uh, 19th, 20th century. Okay. But today, there are many uh, people that have, that have uh, questioned this shift between Sinophilia, uh, 17th, 18th century, and Sinophobia after that. So, as for me, I will divide it in three. Uh, phases, similarity, subalternity, and alterity. So I say that we say that from medieval times to uh, 17th to 18th century, Chinese realities were framed in terms of similarity in the West. This is very important because if you look at postcolonial studies, they will always say that Chinese realities is defined in terms of the other. But it's not true for what is be, uh, before uh, 18th century, 19th century. So. And, and, here, and this is really uh, interesting because in the last 10 years, there is a lot of extremely erudite uh, uh, books that have been published and uh, trying to uh, question uh, the postcolonial narrative in uh, precise uh, uh, erudite uh, historical terms. So, for example, for the medieval period. So, uh, he says that... Um, um, yes, so medieval European travelers admire the Yuan Mongols and the Han Chinese and their, and their civilization, perceiving more similarities and differences between themselves and the people of the Yuan China. So, and then, uh, Jürgen Osternheim, he said, among 18th century travelers, freedom from prejudice is equated with fairness towards foreign manners and an impersonal detachment from one's own. That means that in, in 18th century travelers, we also, more, we, we more often than not, see uh, an attitude uh, which try to be free from prejudice and toward appreciation. 
Then you have uh, then you have a change uh, uh, after uh, uh, after the middle of the 18th century with the emergence of subalternity, subalternity. And that means that, uh, for example, from Lamy to Kant, you have a big change in terms of the relation, the way the West see China. And, um, yeah. For example, we know that for Lamy's, Lamy's places Chinese culture on a higher or at least an equal level to Europe. Herder portrays China as the biggest failure in the course of the history of humanity. So big changes. Okay. We know that. So, uh, and you can find a lot of, uh, of, of, of example of the way Chinese realities are framed in terms of subalternities, that means inferior to. And, uh, and I, there is so many that, I mean, it's almost endless to, to count them. Okay? And uh, so, for example, uh, with these books, which is called Chinese Characteristics, and uh, it says that we are not about to complain that the Chinese language cannot be made to convey human thought. This, for this appears to be a truth, but only to insist that such a language, so constructed, ambit to intellectual turbidity. That means that because you are speaking Chinese, thus you cannot really think. Okay? This is common trope at this moment of time. And then, in the 18th century, you have a different framework, which is alterity. And that means that the Chinese other. So here, uh, you, you, you start to see uh, uh, China as the real other of the West. The real other to capitalism, to capitalism. So it is important, for example, in terms of Maoist studies, the the perception of, of, of Mao in the West is is actually framed by the fact that at the moment of the time you have always you have already had uh, the perception of China as the other, and the, this this being other is positive. Okay. Here, uh, what you have is first uh, in the in the 20th century you start to have the discourse about the decadence of the West the decline of the West. But this discourse of the decline of the West is starting in the West before being, I would say, reused by China over and over and over, from Long Chichang to Xi Jinping, etc. Over. And uh, activity as a framework to define Chinese learning, to define China, to define Chinese reality, activity means to, to define China as views of the West, is something that becomes very dominant in, in philosophy also. And so you have two kinds of, of two, two ways of thinking. You have the uh, Asian way of thinking, and you have the European way of thinking. And this is, you can see that in Heidegger, and even in, in Derrida. So even in Derrida, he says okay, you have logocentrism, which is the West, and you have Chinese writing, which is beyond logocentrism. And of course, uh, this um, this way to define uh, activity. Uh, Chinese uh, China as the other is something that is true both in the West and in China itself. And here, for comparative study, that means that uh, it is the framework of activity that explain the success, I would say, of all these discourses from Roger Enns to François Julien. I mean, what the West is, China is not. So uh, uh, the West is being, China is becoming. Okay? So the West is war, China is peace. Now, uh, I will propose another. Uh, uh, now, I will propose something uh, which is different. Uh, so this is uh, this is what, what we are. I will say in uh, in the middle of the 20th, at the end of the 20th century. Then, what starts to appear in the 20th century is that uh, some sinologists they start to develop a kind of history of the history of comparing cultures. And, uh, and here there is two papers that were for me essential, the paper of Nicolas Standard and the paper of Jacobsen. But the, 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 second, the Standard paper is, is impressive. So uh, uh, Jacobsen uh, paper is more usual. He says that, okay, uh, um, wh when people uh, study, sorry, Jacobsen, he defines two moments of the studies of transfers and influences from China to Europe in the 20th century. And in the beginning, you have all this. In the beginning of the 20th century, we forgot about it. But in the beginning of the 20th century, you have a lot of intellectuals who will speak about China in terms of the way China and India shape Europe, uh, Europe culture. 
a lot of a lot of uh, of, of books were about were uh, addressing the, the 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 question of in which sense uh, China influenced Europe and Europe become what it is because of its influence. Okay, uh, Adolf Reichwein in uh, 1925, uh, Virgil Pinot in 1932, uh, uh, Raymond Schwab for India in 1950. You have all these kind of books which are which were actually very very um, positive in the uh, perception of China and India, and also not only positive because positive is not so much interesting, but which are also very interesting because uh, they they try to uh, to demonstrate how these uh, Hybridity actually transform Europe itself, and we we'll go back to that at the, at the end. And of course, the second moment of the studies of transfers and influences from China to Europe is opened by Said with Orientalism, and then different by Orientalism, and and, and I will uh, at the end show the problem with that. Okay. Um, yeah. So. What is interesting is that Jacobsen also is starting to point out the limits of the post-colonial narrative. And as I said before, you have different books that are addressing this problem. For, um, quite recent, Oster Hammer in Unfabling the West and Oss App in the Birth of Orientalism. They both try to uh, have a kind of post-post-colonial uh, uh, reading of uh, the influence of China in the West. And they are both very erudit. Oster Hammer is, is like 800 pages. It is an incredible book. <laughs> So, uh, Canterbury critiques of cultural studies have uh, demonstrated now that uh, Said Orientalist framework, according to which every European in what he could say about variant was consequently a racist, an imperialist, and almost totally ethnocentric, this is rather misleading. Uh, if you want to understand uh, what uh, uh, Western of, of uh, representation of China, and I will give a case study at the end. So, why, why it is misleading? First, because uh, the fact is that if you want to say that the um, negative perception of Chinese culture with the West is the consequence of a colonial project, the problem is that the negative perception of China in the West starts before the beginning of the colonial project. So, And moreover, and I, I, I will then uh, 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 insist on that at the end. For me, uh, one of the, the most important uh, uh, missing points with post-colonial framework of Oriental studies and the way to approach uh, Chinese uh, uh, perception, uh, the perception of Chinese West, is that it neglects completely the fact that uh, 17th and 20th century study of China and Indian texts was pivotal in fostering European modern crisis. So. European modern identity is a consequence of the influence of non-European non culture on Europe. For me, this is one of the most important points in recent uh, transcultural studies, and it is a point, uh, it is uh, an idea uh, that is for me, um, I would say, very relevant, and I think um, promising in terms of his uh, explanatory power. So, Europe's discovery of Asian religion was deeply linked to the development of Orientalism and its gradual emancipation from biblical studies. So the encounter, so the translation of a religious uh, text from China, or a Chinese uh, of text from China, uh, a religious text from India, sorry, or a text from China, actually it creates a sense of cultural crisis. And uh, one of these um, one of these um, manifestation of this crisis, I will, I will give to, uh, to that example at the end, is the de development of, uh, in Europe, of a culture which was uh, trying to relativize, relativize um, Catholicism, uh, Christianism, and its cultural foundation uh, for Europe. So as Jean-Paul uh, Jean Rubier said, I don't know how to pronounce, um, European modernity was now, at least in part, defined as a scientific, educational. So he say now means uh, 18th century. European modernity was now, 18th century, at least in part defined as a scientific, educational, and political project against Europe's own religious and cultural heritage. What does that mean? 
That means that when we speak about uh, Europe's influence on China in the 20th century, uh, in the 19th century, we forgot the fact that the Europe that was acting on China in the 19th century was a Europe that was already transformed by China in the 18th century. And this changed everything. It changed everything because what uh, Europe brings to China is not simply European. It was also already a, a, a consequence of Chinese influence on Europe. And then you cannot reject it. You cannot reject democracy as Western when uh, actually it seems that democracy, as it has been uh, developed uh, recently uh, by um, an American scholar, uh, democracy uh, in Europe also started to develop by the diffusion of uh, Chinese texts uh, uh, in uh, Europe intellectual. Uh, in the 19th century. And so in this book, he, he developed how, he, he tried to demonstrate how the, how the uh, translation of Mencius was actually pivotal to, uh, to first uh, a, crit a critique of uh, aristo aristocracy, uh, political aristocracy in Europe. And then uh, Stendhal, he defined fourth moment of the history of the study of Christianity. I will go very quick, because these fourth moments are very interesting. He said, and, and, and this paper is very rich, and I, I don't think so many people have read it, but for me it's one of the most important papers in terms of methodology of uh, comparative philosophy. Uh, even if it, it speaks on the study of Christianity, but it's larger than that. So he says there is a fourth moment. First is model of transmission. The people who are uh, studying Christianity in China, they will look at how missionaries transmitted Christian faith in China. If they fail, or, or success or fail, success or fail. Then the second moment is the moment of reception. It is how Chinese reacted to Christian faith. And then you have here the development of the Sinocentric sino cultural essentialism, uh, which, which is that Christian Christianity as the other of China, that cannot be understood by China, position of journey. The third moment is framed by the model of invasion. And it came from Said Orientalism. Here, there is a, the difference is that um, here you stress the fact that it is impossible. It, you are not stressing the fact, like in the reception model, that uh, Chinese they cannot receive the Western the Western uh, uh, knowledge because it is Western. But here, the notion of invention, this framework, which is linked to Orientalism, is the fact that uh, Westerners cannot understand Chinese learning because of their own bias and various gaze. Okay. But then, Stenet, he, 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 he tried to advocate for a fourth model, the interaction model. Here what he says is that he stretched the agency of the other and its influence on us. So he says that uh, 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 Chinese science has influenced uh, Western thinking in the process of this transmission. So what is very interesting for us in terms of philosophy is that this, uh, this fourth model uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. This fourth model is based on the philosophy of, um, of a philosopher, Francis Jacques, Defense of Subjectivity which is uh, defining the thing that we have uh, spoken about before with Jean-Luc Nancy. Uh, Francis Jacques, in his book Defense and uh, Subjectivity, he says that um, the, the, this idea, that means that uh, um, we, what I am is defined in relation to the other, and without the other, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not existing. So I'm not, cannot, I cannot say I without you. Okay, this is also Martin Buber's uh, concept. And the notion that I cannot uh, say I without you is for me also one of these transcendental uh, 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 foundation of the transculturality. I cannot say my culture without your culture. And then when I say my culture, it is already your culture and an reverse. And, and so, uh, yes. So, uh, what is important here is that uh, standard fourth model of uh, interaction, it uh, helps us to understand the, 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 the limits of the postcolonial discourse and the notion of technology. Because, as Oster Hamel said, 
Ken Wasaid and many of his followers attributed a blindness to European culture in the age of imperial expansion, an incapacity to enter into dialogue with, with other culture, but without, and we say it, without looking at the fact that actually there was this reciprocal influence. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so uh, also um, one of the book, uh, recent book, that is really trying to uh, de uh, de post or post post colonialize uh, classical sinology is uh, Edward uh, Singerland's uh, 2019 book Mind and Body in Early China, and which is a radical critique of all the dualist uh, François Julien style uh, definition of uh, West and China. West and China. Um, cultural interaction. Of course, uh, the sinocentric modon, uh, postmodern activity mo uh, modon, uh, which is present in sinology, is also uh, present in China, and you have always this discourse when you oppose China, and which is holistic and unity, and uh, we with the West, which is dualist, atomistic, uh, uh, and mechanistic, and etc. Okay, no, no need to spend so much time on that, you know. And uh, of course, we have the same kind of discourse, not only in China, but also uh, in, uh, in the West for a long time. Okay, now, I will finish with a case study. I will finish with a case study uh, to uh, analyze the show. And here, I'm starting with an image, this image. So, what is this image? This image he shows Confucius, which is an ideal sage, and it appears in a uh, book edited by, published by uh, Isidore Stanislas Hellman for his abrégé historique, the principal trait of Confucius, published in 1788. And actually, it is based on the book of Joseph Amiot, La Vie de Conce, and uh, 17. Uh, 84. So, you look at this image, and then, how we can interpret this image? It has been uh, created at the end of the 18th century, so normally the beginning of Orientalism, and the beginning of the negative Western imperialist, colonialist perception of China. Okay. And here you have a rather nice portrait of Confucius. How can you understand that? So, usually, when we want to understand these kind of representations, we have two, uh, two narratives, as I said, the narrative of Orientalism, and uh, of the fact that uh, every, uh, every representation of, the, the, of non-Western cult cultures in uh, the West uh, was, uh, was um, I would say, belittling uh, the other, was diminishing the value of the other culture, and you have uh, uh, um, Chinese study, post-colonial uh, intellectual, we say, for example, sinology is part of the long history of imperialism, colonialism, etc. And that even today, sinologists actually are like the Christian mi uh, missionary. What they want is to reject uh, Chinese culture. And they, they hate Chinese culture, as, as you can see here. Sorry for the irony. And, uh, and the other kind of discourse is the discourse of chinoiserie and exoticism. Chinoiserie, what does that mean? Chinoiserie means that you have a kind of appreciation of Chinese culture, that's true, but this appreciation is actually a transformation. It is misleading, it demonstrates a misunderstanding of the other, it is a misrepresentation of what the other really is because there is a reality of this other as other. And this is exotic system. this is a kind of exoticism in the sense that, uh, there is a, uh, exoticism in the sense that, um, exoticism has been defined by uh, Victor Segalen, which is the first one to define theoretically exoticism. Uh, he says that, um, he said by exoticism, I mean uh, one thing, to be, um, which is um, the feeling which diversity stirs in us. And he, he, he says that diverse 
is what, what is foreign and everything that is other. So the appreciation of the other as other, because it is other. This is exoticism. And what we try to do is a reverse. We try to define other and oneself and oneself as other at the same time. Okay? Because which is what love is about. So Orientalism and Exoticism, they seem to be opposed because Orientalism is negative perception of the other and Exoticism is positive perception of the other. But actually they are, they are similar because they are both essentialist. They are both defining another which is completely other to us. So both uh, this Orientalistic and uh, exo Exotic perception of the other, uh, a framework to understand our relation to the other, um, is can, what you cannot see is transcendental hybridity. So, the image of Confucius that you have here, why it is like this? Actually, it is because uh, the, the missionary, when they uh, define this image, it is because they relate to something that is not uh, in European culture, but which is in Chinese culture. So, actually, they use a Chinese image to make a European representation of China. So here you can already see the hybridity of it. Okay? It's not simply that they impose. If you are in the Orientalist uh, uh, narrative, you say they will impose a European representation of China in order to make it European. But actually, it's not what they, exactly what they, what they did. They tried to, to find something which represents majesty, power, in China. And they found this image of the emperor. Of course, it is European in some sense because you won't, uh, you won't portray Confucius as an emperor. And it is European so in some sense that in this way, it is like the sage is above the emperor, which is here very, uh, I would say, uh, potentially provocative. Yes. Then, uh, this image, it appears in different, uh, it, it appears in different places. So the first, uh, one of the first apparitions uh, because what we see in the book of 19, so what we see uh, just before, okay, in this book, okay, in uh, 1788, uh, okay, it is related to uh, one of the first, uh, sorry, one of the first image of Confucius uh, in uh, Europe, this one, which is uh, in, the, in the beginning of the Confucius Sinarum Philosophus in, uh, uh, in 1687. And then you have uh, Jean-Baptiste Duhal, which changed a little these two images. I can, we can discuss of why this changes. But what is for me uh, interesting is that in uh, the book La Morale de Confucius, the, the Morality of Confucius, which is wrote by Jean Labrune, a libertine intellectual, one year after the Confucius in Arum, we also find the same image. So what is very interesting is that both Catholic missionaries and libertine actor, uh, intellectuals they share the same representation of consciousness. Why? Because they both have the same positive uh, understanding of consciousness, even if it is for completely opposite uh, intellectual and social and political agenda. And this is totally, cannot be grasped at all with any kind of post-colonial narrative. Just so if we follow the post-colonial narrative, we mean that, okay, we, that we mean that uh, these two images are the same. You see? And they are not the same at all. Okay? Because they will say, okay, uh, what uh, Westerners say about China in the late uh, uh, 18th century and 19th century, it is uh, a negative representation of China as inferior culture. But these two, this is racist, imperialist, colonialist, as much as you want. True. Okay? And this is uh, in kind of uh, British press. Okay? Uh, books as well. Okay? A, a lot of negative. Uh, 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 representation come from this period in the West. But actually, this, this will be misleading and more. If you look at this image, you see that there is a poem here. And this is very interesting because this poem is a poem of Voltaire. And so, this is a poem of Voltaire, which is added by the editor of a book about Confucius writing by a missionary. I mean, this is hybridity multiplied by 5, 10. And this is reality. This is real in, uh, uh, cultural encounter. This is not all the discourse, the other, etc. This is real. This is what we see, the image of it. Okay. So, if we want, uh, 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 if we want a correspondent of this kind of negative image of China in the West, you can find in China. 
And, and what is interesting is that uh, in China in the 18th century, you have uh, a very negative representation of Christianity. As you can see here, uh, the Christ is, uh, um, is a poor, and, uh, and here you have sin, which is written, okay? And uh, the foreigners are um, sheep, okay? And one yang, and yang, okay? And two uh, jiang, and, and, and ten two jiang, and two jiang, okay? So ten two jiang becomes the, the, the cry of the, of, the, of, the, of the pork, okay? Yeah? And, uh, and here, of course, and here why? Because actually there is a connection in China between anti Christian tradition and anti foreign tradition. And uh, I think also this uh, recently shot some of kind of continuity. Uh, how to uh, treat the uh, fray, uh, 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 I would say, disposal, yeah, uh, garbage, yeah. So here you can also find a, a, a negative image of the other. So here what is important is to, is to remind that transcultural is not only about, I speak about law, transcultural is not only about law. Sometimes it is, can be also, hate can be transcultural. However, when hate is transcultural, it is transcultural by negating its transculturality. Because it is by, re, by reaff, reaffirming the difference into cultures. Okay, but this we can. Uh. And also, an, an, a reason why this post colonial reading of the West uh, uh, as having a negative and uh, imperialistic uh, perception of China is also uh, completely at odds with the fact that actually the Christian missionary they were not trying to. Uh, to promote Chinese as the invasion of China. What we were actually doing is to try to promote uh, the accomplishment of the Chinese emperor. And so here, this is really two, uh, this is so, uh, in the um, uh, eight, uh, middle of the 18th uh, century, uh, so, uh, sorry, it's, it's, uh, um, so here you have uh, uh, the um, China which commanded a, a series of engraving to uh, European um, printers and uh, engravers. And this uh, uh, engraving, they represent, the, they celebrate the conquest by Qianlong of the, of the West. Okay, a region which is now uh, Xinjiang. And here what is interesting is that the Jesuit, far from, I mean like uh, uh, here, at the visit, far from having a kind of perception of China as inferior or something to be dominated, was actually vehiculating the propaganda of the Chinese Empire to the Western audience. And this is a manifestation of that. So here what, what is represented is what is known today as the genocide of the Junga. Huh? Today we spoke about what is, this is, this is a, an episode in China history where you have uh, where Qianlong uh, uh, decide to uh, kill uh, about uh, five, um, 600,000 uh, people uh, in uh, this region, which is now the Xinjiang. So, uh, here, for me, uh, and I finish here, uh, 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 last two, uh, for me what is uh, problematic with the post-colonial uh, Western representation, so uh, what is even more problematic is the fact that the post-colonial uh, representation, um, yes, the post-colonial reading, sorry, of Western representation as Catholic, Catholic imperialism completely ignores and overlooks the, the whole libertine tradition. And this is problematic because, as we have said, and as we have said, and I repeat it, this libertine tradition was so influential both in the, in the reception of Chinese culture in Europe and in the transformation of culture itself. So when you, 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 see, you, you say that Western representation, uh, the West is a kind of is Catholic imperialism or Christian co uh, colonialism, what you are not seeing is that the perception of Chinese culture has been extremely important to libertine thinkers. And these libertine thinkers, they were the one who transformed European culture and make enlightenment possible. And enlightenment possible is modernity. And modernity is what comes to China. It's natural. It is modernity. And, uh, and then la last, uh, uh, last line, uh, that's like, uh, here, um, the, the problem with this post-colonial reading of Western imperialism is that it prevents us to see non-Western imperialism. 
and to address everything that is not Western as benevolent and civilization. So, for example, the extension of Chinese culture is civilization. It is not a colonialism. But the extension of Western civilization is colonialism, this kind of, of, of discourse. Okay? And um, here I will uh, finish by this quote of uh, Wang Jisoo of uh, last year. He says that the influence of China as a representative of the yellow race is also rising rapidly. In the age of the American elite represented by white people, okay, uh, it is intolerable for Chinese civilization to replace Christian civilization so that we do everything to prevent Chinese development. Okay, so here we have this official uh, ideology. And what it is interesting is that it defines your culture in terms of Christian civilization. Why? Actually, we know that since the 18th century, European, European culture has developed a massive process of secularization. So to define uh, this civilization as Christian is to be today extremely problematic because it completely overcome, it completely overlook this whole process of secularization. And I will say that if uh, here uh, this civilization is to overlook the European, proce the European process of secularization in Europe, it is because this process of secularization does not have not happened in China PRC. And this is what I was uh, trying to say uh, last year when I said that uh, the specificity of China is that China is the China of the exit of China as a religion. Okay. And uh, my point here will be that without with secularization and decolonization of culture, there is no transcultural encounter. So one of the conditions of possibility of uh, transcultural encounter is also a decolonization of one's culture. Yeah, okay, so I uh, thank you for your attention and I finish here. Okay, uh, 非常感谢, uh, 何老师的, 这个非常, 非常精彩, 非常完整的报告, uh, 我刚刚用法语说的, 其实他今天做的报告, 不是, uh, 报告一篇文章, uh, 我的感觉是他今天做给我们, uh, 蓝图一个blueprint或者这个一个一个这个一本书的结构，因为呃他是从这个呃从这个生命这个问题life开始，然后呃就思考这个呃先思考这个transcendental呃philosophy的历史跟呃呃意义啦，然后从transcendental呃
所以这个不是鸦片战争之后，就是是呃一个单向的一种呃一一一个就是欧洲一直不断的攻击中国，呃，其实没有这个，他们早就从十六世纪开始有一个非常复杂的一个一个一个呃一个互相影响的的关系。但是如果你就是用一个比较简单的呃帝国主义、殖民主义或者这个东方主义的呃。角度去思考啊、呃，那你会完全忽略那个十六、十七、十七、十七的这个，呃，这个中国文化对欧洲的 libertine、libertine 思想家的这个重要性。所以今天的报告真的有很多很多的不同的脉络、不同的问题，我们可以好好的谈。我的感觉是，这个真是一本书。我觉得我们刚刚看到的，呃。五个阶段是可以作为五五五五个章节 ，five chapters， 然后就给我们一个呃这么思考跨文化 （transcultural philosophy） 的一个方法论，一个方法论。那呃，我觉得我们就呃公开的讨论啊、呃，那呃在座的同仁啊、呃，我相信你们都有很多的问题想要请教呃何老师，我自己也有，所以我们用中文、英文啊、呃、法语都可以啊。呃呃，就用呃英文来讲，这个 today was an intellectual feast， 就是真的是，呃，一个知识上的一个呃非常丰富、非常丰盛的报告。所以呃，我们就公开的这个提问，呃，在座的各位。那我因为呃语言的关系，我不用英文哈，不问呃提问。可以。So my question is um um two questions. The first one is regarding the concept of transcendental in in、uh, this uh well interpretation that you make of uh transcultural as today's transcendental or the transcultural as transcendental. So I don't think if there is a difference between these two concepts. So would you say that the Transcultural is the transcendental of our age, or would you say that the transcendental, the transcultural, because but the phenomenon that you just analyzed at the end, uh, it's a, a, an exchange that it's not happening, that happened a few centuries ago. So, so I wonder whether whether there is a, a historical uh, approach to this question. So, to, to this, you say it's not an analogy. You say that in fact the the, the transcendental, the transcultural is transcendental. Okay. And now, uh, regarding the, so this is the first question. Okay. Now the second question is the difference between transcendental and transcendent. I I, I know that you don't want to uh, you do at the beginning also define or try to distinguish、uh, the transcendental and the transcendent. But I think that、um, when when you come come back to the question of of, of love and sex and and so on, I I sometimes I think that the kind of experience that you are describing is. I would say closer to a kind of experience of transcendence in the sense of、um, of something that is going beyond the uh,、um, let's say in another way、uh, the transcendental is the conditions of possibility for 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 experience.、Uh, now the question, the problem is that actually what is happening in this experience of of, of love. Is 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 that we are touching at the limits of the experience itself. So so we can see the sexual relation is the re relation to the relation itself. Now this is something that the traditional concept of transcendental doesn't seem to contain. But this actually the traditional concept of transcendental is something that you don't experience when you are experiencing the object. Is the reason why you have the experience of the object, but but you are not experiencing the transcendental as such. As such. That, that you experience that in, in Kant. So in, in the in the deduction and all the things that he has. So so in that sense, I personally think that、uh, in a sense, I think that perhaps the concept of transcendence would be also a way of trying to articulate this. this thing.、Mm -hmm. So this is my second question. And my third question is just uh, 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 the, uh, regarding to, to today. So so、uh, so so you you sh you actually your example at the end shows how、uh, the what would. Be、uh, understood in the framework of similarity. So, so uh, uh, it's uh, in fact uh, already an, an exchange, or 
my, my question is uh, very simple. Okay, I, what what would be today in today's discourse or in today's uh, discourse about uh, otherness, transcultural, and so on? What would be the the, the liberty today? Who, what, the, 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 the uh, liberty today? So who 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 would play that role? What would be the kind of libertinage that uh, uh, would be taking pla place or should take place? discourse about uh, transculturality. Sorry, three questions. Okay. Uh, very, very good question. Uh, should I maybe just简单的翻译一下? Very简单. Very简单. The most simple language. The first question is, because today, Dr. Lee also talked about transcendental philosophy, which is Chinese language, which is transcendental, transcendental. I don't know if transcendental is something that we can think about. Can you help us to translate it? Can you help us to translate it? 我们可以翻译做超越论者学，超越论者学，对，那个哦，很好很好，那个超越论者学，超越性，所以transcendental是，那时候先先呃先验吧，这个是transcendental，现在是先验，对，说问题就复杂，translation if racism of questions, yeah, yeah, there are debates surrounding the Chinese translation. Yeah, 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 比喻嘛，是一个 analogy， 还是是真真的？他们在逻辑上是一样的。第二个问题是，呃，关于 transcendental 跟 transcendent 的这两个概念的关系。那这个可能我们需要呃，为了就是如果想要翻成中文，我们就要进行一个很专门的关于翻译的讨论。所以我们就先用英文的 transcendental 跟 transcendent。Uh, 因为按照 Kant 的这个论述 ，transcendence 是 knowledge beyond experience， 是一种呃超越经验的知识。那呃，这个跟 transcendental 就是 knowledge about experience， 就是关于经验的知识，呃，是呃两回事。但是呃。高老师就请教何老师进一步的讨论他们呃的关系。然后第三个问题是关于呃在今天的呃何老师说给我们看的历史的案例，这个 historical case study 就是中西的这个交流。呃，在从十六世纪之后，他特别强调呃一种角色，就是 the liberty， 就是可能自由。知识上很自由的人，就是不受到呃宗教的束缚的控制，也不受到跟一个学术的专业性的束缚。他们就是可以拿用很多，他们希望庄子，希望呃孔子，然后，但是他们把孔子跟庄子帮他们，就是可以回应他们在地的一些问题的。所以这个是很自由、很拿用的一个角色。那高老师有呃问一个很有意思的问题，就是今天二十一世纪的这些 liberty， 这些不受到。呃，学术的束缚也可能不受到宗教的束缚，但是还是呃，在跨文化交流当中，呃，扮演非常关键的角色。先这个时代的 liberty 啊、呃、是谁？就是第三个问题。好，那我们就可以用英文回答。Okay, uh, so, thank you for the thank you for this question, this good question. Um, they're not easy to answer. So I would say that uh, regarding the first question, actually. We have also to remind the, this whole uh, development from Kant to Dicte and from the uh, subjective, uh, subjective um, identity, uh, subjective identity for the transcendental, from uh, transcendental subjectivity to the question of forms of life. And um, if you look to this, uh, to this process of uh, this transformation of the concept of transcendental uh, subjectivity for different ways in terms form of life, which then have an application to cultural form of life. Um, what I will say is that if you look at the framework that I, I, I refer to, in this framework you will remark that um, the notion of I is in some sense an illusion, in the sense that, um, in the sense that uh, if you speak about love as a, a, motor, a, a vector of the relation, that means that, in terms of, uh, you cannot define the beginning of 
the, your perception of reality by I. Since this, so here, the transcendental is transcultural in the sense that what comes first is encounter. So in this sense, it is a, a re-development uh, of uh, the uh, subjective definition of the transcendental. The foundation can't define the transcendental. This is also what Deleuze said, actually. The foundation of transcendental in subjectivity is problematic because the field of the transcendental is actually uh, 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 beyond the limits of the subjectivity. This is why Deleuze tried to link to the process of de-subjectivation. Okay. And this process of de-subjectivation, if, if we say that subjectivity is linked to a specific form of life and then one culture, this process of de-subjectivation is the encounter of different cultures. So in this sense, also, uh, transcendental is transcultural, not, not in, some, in the sense that it does not start with ourselves, but with the relation, but also that this relation is always already a relation between two cultures. Okay, for the first uh, question. Second, about, oh yeah, about transcendent and transcendental. Actually, Jean-Luc Nancy in sex, uh, in his, uh, um, because here, yeah, of course, I'm, um, I'm using uh, Plato and, and then I'm shifting to Nancy, which is actually not possible because Plato, there is a third term and, and uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, he insists on the fact that there is no third term on the relation and this is why there is a relation. This is why the relation is real, because there is no third term. So here, um, I am using this, um, you know, the, the way to, uh, to uh, overcome this issue is again to go through the concept of, of the laws of immanence, of something which is in between. When he, in his last text about uh, in vie, uh, immanence, immanence in vie. And so here, there is not a third term there is no third term as a term, but the space of the anchor term is a third term which is not a term. Then, if you, if you want to answer the question of transcendent in a more uh, 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 classical way, of course, to define the transcultural as transcendent is, I would say, something which is uh, rational and which is, I would say, um, interesting. And for example, here you can define transcultural as some universal categories that exist in all human beings uh, and uh, different from any kind of cultural uh, setting, more like the cognitive uh, uh, things. Um, but uh, even in Kant, the notion of categories is still linked to the notion of transcendental. And uh, so in Kant, the, the notion is, actually transcendent does not mean that we can know beyond experience, because for Kant, there is no knowledge of beyond experience at all. So the only thing that is beyond experience is morality. Okay. And uh, so uh, here, um, I, I, I understand what you say, that, but for me, to uh, try to define the transcultural not in the, not in the, not in terms of transcendent, is also to try to maintain it in the field of philosophy and not, for example, of anthropology or cognitive studies. So for me, this is important to maintain this distinction because transcendental is something which is very specific to philosophy. Of course, in all this, I'm very religious, I know, but just, yeah, I'm just trying to, 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 to develop this framework. About the third question, uh, about the third question, um, Yeah. Ah, so uh, uh, about the first question, the yeah, I think it's a very difficult question. But for me, uh, I will say that the libertine has I, I, it's kind of a Hegelian answer, so I'm not sure it's a good answer. But I mean, they, they have played their role when they have to play it. It they were an historical figure, and then they have a historical value. So this is a moment of historicity that cannot be repeated, and we don't need to, to see a repetition of it. 
And, and what is for me, uh, what is for me, why also I, 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 I insist on this notion of libertine in terms of reception of Chinese uh, culture, because it is usually it is very, very, very seldom addressed. This notion you speak about the language, you speak about that, but you don't speak uh, very, very, very few people speak about the French libertine reception of Chinese culture. Um, there are some, but not a lot. Um, for example, Guy Basil, uh, he, uh, Basil Guy, sorry, he wrote a book like uh, uh, 70 years ago. Yeah, so it's not, not uh, uh, but this, precisely that. Um, so, so I would say they play a role, and also because, of course, because I, speak, I try to make a connection between the metaphysic of love and sexuality as the, uh, as uh, the relation of the other in yourself and, the, and yourself in the other, etc. And this, of course, sexuality is one important point of the philosophy of the libertine. Yeah. So, because we have the two kind of, uh, we have more and uh, flourish form. So, I didn't ex explicit this point, but of course, there is, in this way, it is interesting that the first one in Europe, actually the first one who, who, who were doing Transcultural philosophy, not for uh, like not missionary. Transcultural philosophy were liberty. Mm -hmm. So when I when I want to understand transcultural uh, the notion of transcultural through the metaphysic of love, it makes historically it makes some sense actually. Uh, not totally, but some sense. Yeah. But so today, I, I, um, yeah, I, I think it's a historical figure. Thank you so much, Chai, for this uh, for this response, and uh, we'll let uh, Dean Lang. Uh, I I think the answers will just let everybody absorb because uh, it might take too, uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, yeah, uh, Transcendental 那便是意義很強那當然從你今天的英文的報告裡面那從這個地方你就連結到生活的問題也就是重新對生活做定義生活不是跟哲學沒有關係反而它反而變成了生活它反而變成了是一個關係發生的那個原發處所以你追溯到古希臘的這個問題那同時就賦予了這個概念比現在到底要是要用翻成cross-culture 其實重新定義了重新定義了很多東西那也就是說如果從Transcendental的這個Transculture來看的話沒有兩個文化先存在在相遇的問題事實上文化本身就不能夠用沒有用一個自身跟他者這兩個概念反而自我就必須自我從來
，比较有意思的就是说，你现在前面谈的这个这个论述，跟我们现在呃中山文渊在谈跨文化，其实理念是相当契合的。可是你有一个部分，我觉得非常有特色，就是说，你会把它，你会把这些跨文化的概念落实到东西或中西的。那个几百年来，那个从十六、十七世纪的文化交涉，它背后其实有很多历史阶段。你要 deconstruct 解构这个很多的那个那个 bias， 我觉得这部分的工作有点像 c o d e 的工作，有点有点像是那个呃系统学的考古，然后慢慢把那个 layer 呈现出来，然后谈说，哎，现在的 t r a n s c u l t u r e 应该要怎么样超越前前面几个阶段。这个部分我觉得很有启发性啊！你中间提到的一个问题，我我想趁这个时候提出来。你谈到那个 sex， 那个性的问题，谈到那个呃 tantric b u l l y i n g 然后当然这个部分你就会连接到不只是藏传那个 d e b a t e n 的那个 b u l l y i n g 也有也有所谓的那个双修的问题，对，男女双修的问题。那里面也有一种那个 sex m y s t i c s y 性的神秘主义的这个传统，东方也有阴阳的概念，然后也有那个那个 sex alchemy 性的炼金术。可是这个你举的这个例子到底是要证成你的这个性真正的性是两者遭遇，其实是认识自己跟他他者，而且产生更多差异。还是说，就你举的这个东方的印度的传统也好，藏传传统，或是东方的阴阳传统也好，它背后是不是有一个 metaphysical metaphysical thinking？ 事实上，那个阴阳是要 combine， 变成这个 holy one、嗯。所以，当它在这个所谓的进行的这一个结结合的时候，它不是要产生更多差异，它其实是要终结差异，它其实要，它其实要进入到一个。一个 Holy One， 所以这个 Holy One 到底是是真正的？如果照你的 trans transcultural 的定定义的话，文化其实的遭遇是会产生更多的那个差异性的不断的延伸出更多的差异性出来，而且是没有办法被定义的。可是可是这个连接到这个性的神秘主义，它到底是？很多的传统都非常强调这个部分的神圣性。那这个这个，然后从这里谈爱、性跟爱的关系，可是他到底是要跟你谈的那个、那个、那个 metaphor 是是非常类似的，还是其实他还是有一个 metaphysical ideology 的东西在那个地方有待于被 deconstruction？ 我把这个问题提出来。OK， 谢谢。嗯，所以说，你问这个问题是跟刚刚 Victor 问这个 transcendent 跟 transcendent 之间有点像，有点像哈。因为这个词，你做如果变做中文翻译的话，你会怎么翻 ？transcendental 跟 transcendent， 我吗？翻译吗？你会你要你会怎么翻？哈哈哈哈哈！所以，所以这个，所以我会需要更多的时间才可以回答。我，我们等一下再再谈一谈这个。没问题，我让啊有一点，让徐赛回答这个问题。嗯，我会比较想问是这个 transcultural， 就是怎么避免这个跨文化的这个，有可能，有可能一，有可能这个 transcultural 跟 transcultural， 所以你们就是有可能可以用这个 transcultural 来重新定义一个跨文化不是跨文化的跨文化，就是在看你里面。所以你在说是这个 transcendental 怎么翻译？你说你说我吗？对对，也、yeah. 我我主张呃 transcendental philosophy 翻译成超越论哲学，因为它是一种 theoretical perspective upon the conception of philosophy， 所以它是一种对于哲学的看法，而不是比如说呃 naturalist 呃 naturalist con 呃 con conception of philosophy 自然主。或自然论的哲学 ，transcendental philosophy 超越论的哲学是一种 theoretical approach to understand meaning transcendence。所以，所以为什么我会建议这样翻译？来去
区分 transcendence 作为名词或者作为呃 something in the sense of。我上个月论就表示你你上个月的东西是这个论吗？是这个论点吗？就这个你在这边这个 transcendent 要怎么翻译？ transcendent 也、yeah, transcendent transcendent 是超越性或者超越，因为要看在不同的脉络，比如说康德里面的 transcendent 跟海德格里面的 transcendent 是不一样。我想这个是嘛？因为对海德格来说 ，transcendent refers to a characteristic of 大山，所以所以我们比较难说大山有超越性。大山有超越的能力，或者大山有超越此在此或者此刻此时呃此地的呃存在论的这个这个这个是一个 proposal。嗯，可是你你可可是你看在在这边有也有是是这方有问题，因为 transcription 我们说挂文化，那 trans 就是说在这边这边超越，可是如果我们说超越文化，也是这个是这个 transcendent。Transcription 不是这个 transcendental transcription， 所以这是为什你，所以这是为什么我我想把这个两个东西在混迹在一起，是不是？啊、呃，或者是因为如果我们学我们说，夏月露文化，或是这个有点也不确定是是这样的。比如比如说我提出个提议，听听你的今天的演讲，就是跨文化论的哲学，这样是否一个可行的说法？跨文化论哲学是一种差异论哲学，而不是文化研究或者人类学里面的呃关于不同文化的比较研究这样。不是，因为什么？一个是这个呃 trans， 一个变，一个是跨，然后另外一个是超越。为什么只是这个 trans？ 为什么在这边你你你你就是换这个英语，然后这个 trans 就完全不一样的翻译？我就是在这边有一点点，是不是可以？解决这个问题，就是这个可以在，就是说这个 trans 是不是有那种，必须离开离开自己，走出走走出自己。那离开自己走出自己，嗯，不一定是一个形而上学式的那一种超越嘛，哈。嗯。那可是又又现在说汉语，你翻成汉语的时候，你要像你那样解释。我可以理解，尤其放在某一个跟西方哲学家哪里，这些可是如果今天纯对汉语的词语来看，这两个词语的翻译，那个简别度没有经过很复杂的说明，简别度都不大，简别度都不大，这个就是在翻译上面的困难。嗯、对啊、呃，非呃非常感谢戴老师。戴院修老师是我们从香港来的年轻的哲学家啊的发言，然后戴老师等一下，如果你还有问题，你可以发言。那呃，那个戴老师的第二个问题是呃 ，base 呃 ，basically the second question regards tantric Buddhism. You mentioned tantric Buddhism in in your presentation in relation to the concepts of sex and love, and uh, 戴老师 made a, a very interesting point, which is um in the tantric tradition, uh, there's yin yang, there's a metaphysics behind it, right? And that one of the uh, one ways of understanding it is that uh, they the tantric Buddhist tradition wants to um, yes there's difference there's chai but it wants to zongjie chai into a one into a holy one so it's not the goal itself is not difference but it is actually some kind of unity so how do you think about this tantric my uh, goal this element of tantric as especially in relation to the notion of of unity and oneness. Uh, through which difference is actually trying to be combined or merged, and uh, Lyle just wanted to answer, uh, ask about that uh, element of the of the presentation. Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I think that's the presentation. I think I, I got it. Um, is it? I mean, I mean, Zen is an interpretation of tantric Buddhism. <laughs> yes, it's a big thing. But um, in the in the course to which I refer to. What is interesting is precisely the uh, it is a cosmological, not a metaphysical uh, perspective. So from the cosmological perspective, what we see is a process of continuous differentiation, and not a going back to unity, but a process of continuous differentiation. And reaching the other, the other uh, different is different from itself, and differing from itself. It forces you to 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 become also to differ yourself from yourself in order to reach out again to 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 him or her. And so and this is why I cut it because of this process of continuous process of 
uh, self differentiation in the encounter of the other. And as a cosmological metaphor, and in this I can I could relate metaphysics of love with what I said in the beginning about life. Now, uh, in terms of uh, yes, but here the goal is still unity. It seems to me, but I know, I'm not, I mean, far from being a specialist, but it seems to me that in this specific kind of Buddhism, what is stressed is that always in unity there is still difference. That this difference in itself between the two parts of, of the lotus and the flower, they are one, but one has two different parts of something, and not one as there is only one. The one is, the, uh, the condition of possibility of one is the fact that they are always still different. But they are always still different, separate in separation or in combination. But the combination, it seems to me, but it's not uh, a process that is at the end overcoming the essential difference because the point of difference is what assures the cohesion, the cohesion between them, the articulation between them. And, uh, but, but this, again, I, I mean, it's uh, really uh, for, I will say, uh, I know why I use it in terms of the logic of the argument. Now, uh, whether uh, it is, um, whether this uh, understanding of, uh, of Jean-Luc Nancy definition of sexuality to define tantric Buddhism, I think that is a good question. But I'm not the one that can answer that. I mean, you really have to, uh, to go much more deeper than I can in tantric Buddhism to do that. But I think that could be a, a, diff a kind of interesting kind of research. In what sense, what Jean-Luc Nancy said about uh, sexual relation can help us to re re uh, reconsider, re re, re interpret uh, this uh, specific tantric Buddhist uh, tradition. I just hear like a, a metaphor. Uh, but then uh, the explanatory uh, potential of this metaphor is still to be developed. Yeah. Uh, did I? I had. Oh. 那那老师，可能你可以回应一下，就刚刚呃，知道，知道，对对对。就是说，你这个区分是蛮好的啦。就是说，你区分说它是一个 cosmology 的描述。那就是说，东方谈的一。其实跟差异是连接在一起的，这个就是我们跟那个那个 b i l e t t e r 的辩论，比如他谈，他认为东方谈气的时候都在描述那个 unity， 那我们其实是告诉他说，其实那个 unity 是包含 difference， 而且其实是在描述那个 difference connection 的过程而已。那阴阳的解释真的是有两种模型，一种就是你说的，就是说它其实阴阳是。产生差异化的 process， 而且是在那个 difference 的 process 中永无止境。那如果是这样诠释的话，就会比较接近你谈的那个真正的性或真正的性关系。可是你另外一种，尤其修炼传统的时候，他他确实是有一个传统是想要 combine， 然后变成一个 holy one， 认为 difference 其实就是 suffering 的过程。所以其实是要是要终结这个过程，才能够成为一个没有分裂的、没有分裂的状态。这个全是传统，我我觉得也是非常强烈的传统。对，这个是对啊。所以就是为什么我刚刚说，实际上跟 actor 的问题有没有关？因为就是是不是有一个一个东西是 one， 所以这个 one 对我在我的在这个脉络中，这个 one 或者是 transcendent。对，就是在这个呃。嗯，然后你说这个克服这个痛苦这个这个问题，这是非常呃重要的一个部分。呃 ，overcome suffering。嗯，如果用这个呃呃脉络的话，我会就是。But overcoming suffering is only possible when there is no life, no? Oh yeah. So I speak about life, so I can't speak about overcoming suffering because life is suffering. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor.
，呃，他终是知道怎么给我们很有启发性的回应啊。啊、呃，那呃，我我看我们呃也已经四点半，但是我还是要呃给我们在座的一些呃朋友、同仁、专家呃机会呃跟呃发言，就是呃一两个问题啦。呃，我们谢文亮老师在座，他应该是对这个跨文化的研究也有一些想法，还有呃尤充气呃院长尤院长呃是我们现身学的专家啊、呃，不知道尤院长有没有？想要提问，当然呃不勉强，就是啊，还是给你对右院长，谢谢。呃，那个莫老师，感谢你给我机会问两个小问题。就是问之前，我们表达一下那个感谢那个呃何老师呢，再一次到高雄来，你已经来了好几次了。嗯。那个李先生，那个是这样啊，呃，一开始我看你这个题目的时候，感觉到好像。有一点点怪怪的，因为那个 transcendental， 一般跟谈这个，跟谈这个 transcultural 的时候，好像都是分开谈的。那你今天把它包在一起，那我刚刚私底下我就在那边努力的，把这两个字的那个相似的地方嘛，就是想办法把它连接起来，因为他们都有一个 trans。然后你刚才在回答呃戴老师的问题的时候，提到说为什么一个要说跨，一个要说一个超越。其实跨跟超越都有一个共同特性，就是刚才戴老师有戴院长有提到，就是走出去。走出去的话，就是有离开的意思。那我们就要问离开什么地方？那通常来讲，有几个向度可以说。第一个就是说，就是有一个好像 con confine to oneself， 然就是说局限在自己身上。那我们通常是什么在呃限制我们？就是我们的一些很。首先是自我中心的，但是这个自我中心多少就呃带有这样的意思，就是说他不不加思考，不加思考就加以接受，啊、哦，这个在哲学里面就常常会被批判，就是所谓的所谓这种这种所谓的 natural attitude， 啊、呃，很自然而然的想法。那你不管是 transcendental 或者是 transcultural 的话，都是啊、呃、要要离开这样的一个状态。那 transcendental 当然。呃，最早在康德哲学那边，呃，就是说，啊、呃，我们不能够在没有好好的检讨我们所使用的概念，啊、呃，或者是哲学的系统之前呢，我们就，呃，呃，紧紧的抓着不放，这样。那这种传统一直延续下来，在德国的哲学里面，啊、呃，一直被强调，啊，后来在这个，胡塞尔这边的时候，他当然就直接把它拿来跟这个 natural attitude 对照起来。然后造就了他自己的这个所谓的 transcendental phenomenology。那这种这种情况，我想呃，可以说是把这个 transcendental 含义表达的最为明确，最为明确。那如果我们把它延伸呃延伸到那个 transcultural 这一部分来的话，那就代表说我们没有 confine to our own culture， 哦，有这样的一个意思在。那这个时候我们就是提高自己嘛，哦，那跨越到一个。比较高的层次，然后不要让自己局限在，啊、呃，比如说我是一个，呃，东方主义或者是一个西方主义，而是有一个像你所做的工作一样，啊、呃，让自己提高到一个高度，啊、然后可以，啊、呃，做一个比较所谓的超越性的思考，啊，所以不管怎么样，它就是一个，有一定高度的一种一种思考，啊、哦，有这样的含义在，所以我今天非常感谢你，就是第一次听到有人把 transcendental 跟 transcultural 放在一起谈嘛，我觉得这是今天一个很大的收获。那另外一个小问题就是说，这 metaphysics of love， 这是龙系的用法吗？还是你的用法 ？No no 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 no， 完全是你的用法。Yeah yeah yeah， 然后然后呃，龙系肯定，龙系是这样说的。No no no no， I mean it just uh just because I'm starting with Plato， so why I I I I speak metaphysics of love？ I do it， there is there is there is a term， you can you can even there's almost kind of irony in the fact that I'm speaking about。Metaphysics of love, and then I speak about sexuality. Yeah. So uh, just because the starting point is was Plato, and, uh, and Plato, Marcel Fisson, and uh, and then of course here's a to 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 uh, use a Jean Luc Nancy uh, in order to describe this is of course uh, uh, completely Nietzschean. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, yes. 
好，感谢你。呃，如果是这样的话，那我我可能就给你一点小小的 challenge， 啊、嗯，就是说，因为每个地每个地区，它它的根源来自于它本身是一种一种知识的系统。嗯。啊，它无论如何它是 related to related to knowledge， whatever whatever kind of knowledge， OK <咳>。那这个这个 love 的方 love 的话，通常它这个 oriented to a kind of passion。所以对我来讲，这个两个东西是有一点没办法 compatible 啊，我有一点质疑这样的一种用法了哈。那你如果说你要谈的是一个对于 love 的一种，也许你用 p h e n o m e n o l o g y 可能还好一点，像那个马里用他直接是用 p h e n o m e n o l o g y p h e n o m e n o l o g y 来谈谈这个 love， 或或者他说的这个 arrows 这样子，呃，我觉得这个还比较说得通。但是你在今天大家对“行上学”这个字意见这么多的情况之下，你还这么大方的使用 “metaphysics of love”， 呃，我我不晓得，我首先我会觉得很有意见啊，我相信你应该也会遇到很多人跟你提出类似的，呃，类似的挑战啊，谢谢。No, no, I think you are. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for 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 this uh question, I I think you are you are right. I mean, metaphysics of love here was not bad. So. Uh, the best part of the title. Uh, I won't keep it for, for the book. <laughs> and um, and yes, you're right. In this case, I should have spoken more about Marion's agent currency. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, but here, yeah, I was thinking about something else. When you uh, uh, ask this question, is um, because again with metaphysics, you know, <laughs> so we don't say trans physics or uh, cross physics, because meta was after the physics. This was physics, and then the book after the physics. It was the metaphysics. It was just a kind of a chronological order, okay? and then it has become something that is also, uh, I mean, the editing process. And then it has become something that it is uh, defining uh, first philosophy, or say, premier, philosophy premier, and uh, in Aristotle. So, uh, yeah. So that's a. Uh, I definitely need, need to change this metaphysics of love. Yes. Uh, but then, to replace it by what? That's uh, an interesting question. And um, I think yeah, that we, we need to, to, to yeah. Please. I think I, I can explain for you uh, if you mean it just by a, a metaphorical yeah. meaning. That's, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that was, yeah, that was more, as I said, it was a little uh, ironical, actually. And, uh, but at the same time, also because of Plato, as a starting point. And, uh, but, but if I try to, to think about, because of trans, transcendent or trans physical, <laughs> trans physics of love, I mean, because, you know, if, uh, but, uh, what does it mean, trans physics? You know, it's not after the physics, it's not beyond the physics. Uh, so, uh, in some sense, can we not say that natural philosophy was pointing out to this kind of, like this kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, the concept of emergence, yes, is kind of trans physics. What is in physics is beyond physics. But is but is is not not physical. But uh, and not is not beyond it, uh, because otherwise it would be transcendent. Uh, to be, but uh, it is um, something which is at the yeah at the. But here, what is interesting with if I speak about trans physical is that we if we say that trans is between two things, we need to have two physics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the notion, yeah, so, yeah, okay, that's, uh, okay, I, 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 I will think about it, thank you. Very, very thank you, Yu Yuan-Zhang's very important question, you've been asked, very good. Okay, now, uh, okay, now uh, can I, uh, we just have two or three minutes, and then the last one, 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 哦、oh, 对，戴老师你先吧。谢谢谢谢，呃，我呃那个麦克风啊，对，因为先生朋友。Let me speak in English. Um, I, I, it seems to me your research, uh, 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 
raises a lot of critique on two fronts. Mm. On the one hand, you criticize uh, the imperialist um, uh, representations of China in uh, the Western representations, in literature, in philosophy, etc. And on the other hand, you also criticize um, a kind of uh, Chinese official propaganda of the West. Mm. That is a kind of um, uh, stigmatization of the West, stigmatization, stigmatization of Western culture, etc. So it seems to me your research is a very, um, uh, how to say, uh, your, your research confronts a lot of uh, uh, debates here on the table. And uh, 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 it seems to me that the most difficult question from a philosophical point of view is how to specify the moment of uh, encounter of cultures, the moment of Hong Kong, the first year period. Uh, how to uh, specify that uh, encounter as you uh, because you, you, you rely on some uh, uh, I would say ontological studies of, of the ontological studies of touch for example because uh, for John for, see touch is an, is an essential part of love uh, and also of security um, uh, uh, how, how would you um, uh, position the role of conflicts? The, uh, the, the, the role of uh, confrontation, enquietement, encroachment of each other in the moment of encounter of cultures. That's my uh, uh, question. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And thank you for your questions. Uh, and you remember when I, uh, in the uh, beginning, when I uh, was um, speaking about transcendental, the religion definition of transcendental, or what force us to, what, uh, what force us to think and to feel, etc. And if we define transcultural from this transcendental, meaning that transcultural is a moment where cultures are forced to meet. So it's not, this is why the notion of rational dialogue is for me not adapted to this religion definition of the transcendental rationalism that forced us to, because that, the rational dialogue means that you have intentionality, you have, as I say, the good will to dialogue, and you will try to find a consensus. While this thing is actually almost mythical, yes. And uh, I mean, this is beautiful as a model, okay? And uh, it can be useful as, I would say, as a tool sociological tool to approach, I would say, participatory, uh, collaborative, and uh, part, uh, inclusion of different minerals, etc. But, uh, so, and, and this, at this moment I say there's two things that for scripture to meet, I mean, love and, and war, and this is why you speak about that. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so, um, what, what do you speak about that? <laughs> I try to say at this moment, or even briefly, I try to say that um, if war is what can force the future to meet, it is a transcultural moment which is at the same time denying the transcultural fact of it. That means that in this moment of the transcultural, what is done is a re-essentialization of the own culture. So, uh, here, um, you have a process, I mean, this is also, <clears throat> this is why I, I often like to, uh, to use a Latour when he says we have never been modern, his critique of we have never been modern. Say we have never been modern in the sense that when we say this, it is because we have already, it's no other case. For example, uh, we say that modernity is, it is separation from science to culture, and science, sorry, from science to society, precisely at the moment when science and society start to merge and to interact with each other in a, in, in a completely new way. Okay. So, here, the, um, I will say that conflict uh, is something that can, that, is, uh, that can force culture to meet, but the result of that will be more a process of self-separation and 
like self-strengthening movement, you know. Uh, in, in the Chinese, the stretch, self-strengthening movement. And uh, so, and here, of course, you have here you will have there is a process of of separation and also of instrumentalization. Like you know, in the uh, 19th century, uh, Chinese goes to sport, you know, to uh, appropriate the knowledge of the barbarian to be able then to uh, to have uh, to attack them or to overcome them. So here's kind of um, and of course I understand why you say that because of course when you think about love usually is defined in terms of especially in terms of domination, operation. My point is simply to say that um, actually these are very related. You see the post-colonial discourse on the influence of one culture on another defined as domination. The sexual relation as a relation of domination. So this is why I also I link these two things together. Because actually in the discourse they, they follow the same pattern. So I want to, 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 to change the pattern of both at the same time. Because here the notion is, all this pattern is that you have a process of what you see is just, I did not, I, I'm not denying that it is, that in actuality it can happen. Uh, I'm just, uh, I just not uh, want to give to that uh, a conceptual value in itself. So here, what I will say is that this discourse is um, very often empirically correct, uh, but this discourse, what you cannot see is that even in the case of the domination of the other, even in this case, you are also at the same time destroying a part of yourself and changing yourself. So, and this is what is happening also with the colonization of the other. So, the colonization of non-European uh, countries, at the same time, it uh, completely uh, challenges, uh, disrupts the traditional form of urban life with the church, with the king, and with, um, uh, with um, no capital, with, what to say, poverty. Before, traditional mode of life is poverty, no capitalism, okay? the church, no secularization, and the king, and then you have the revolution. So, all these things, of course, it is then difficult to say this is, I didn't say that part of this change is simply coming from the outside, but I say that from this contact with the outside, there is this process. So, it says that Defining the relation simply in terms of domination of the other is, uh, is a way to define the relation as something that still uh, essentializes you and the other, and you impose yourself on the other. And actually, why in this process, often than not, there is this cross interaction, this cross transformation, which is unwillingly, which is not voluntarily. And which is again go, go back to the rest. It is not the, the transcendental is always not voluntarily. It is always what comes to you and not what something that you, you decide to do. Yeah. Okay, very uh, interesting response, and I'm sure at dinner there will be lots of great conversation. Um, I know it's late, but I just want to give one last opportunity for anybody who would like to ask a question. Uh, but of course, no pressure, no pressure. Uh, but and we will have more time uh, on the tagas uh, to talk. Uh, okay. Well, I think maybe I'm getting uh, the sense that uh, I think uh, the room is uh, uh, ready to um, move our conversation outside. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Jean-Yves uh, very, very deeply for a really compelling, really stimulating, as uh, Dai also put it, um, you know, a, a talk that is working on so many different fronts, uh, transcendental philosophy, the metaphysics of love, transcultural philosophy, and then also a critique of West-China interaction, and even up to a critique of the contemporary, uh, some contemporary discourses uh, around that question. So this was a really, you know, very, very 
comprehensive talk. Like I said, I'm very much looking forward to the book. Uh, and uh, I would uh, hope uh, that you come back soon. And I'm already looking forward to our talk tomorrow, our interview. So uh, let's use a warm uh, round of applause to thank uh, Professor Hothabiz, uh, Jean-Yves uh for his wonderful talk today. Thank you.